Hello and welcome to the TFO Football Podcast. I'm Joe Devine and I'm delighted to be joined today by JJ Bulver Bullet. Hello. Hello there. Welcome. Hi. Yes. Jonathan Dog McKenzie. Hello, Joe. All right, how's it going? Yeah, good, thanks. And we're joined by a special guest today, aren't we? A little baby of... <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. A tiny cherub, little baby boy. <laughs> there he is. No, it's uh, it, we, we, listen. Uh, what's his name? What's the manager's name? Patrick, Patrick Vieira. Patrick, we're not joined by Patrick Vieira. I thought, okay, I thought you were asking what my name is. <laughs> not your name. What's his Patrick name? Vieira has been sacked, and we found in the office this Crystal Palace fan hanging around. So we thought, <laughs> get him in the studio, and then we'll ask him questions about that and indeed other things. It's Ruben Pinder. We. Yay! Thank you. A new employee. A new employee to throw names at. Now, what is there on the list of things to discuss today? And Steve, I'm on the wrong bit of the plan. If I've got one for you. Yeah? Kiwi fruits aren't marketed properly. They're delicious and no one buys them and they need better marketing. It's interesting. Do you not think? I bought two the other day, didn't eat them, threw them out. But if people often do that. Do you not think they're very, like now. so delicious, kiwi fruits? Hmm? They just need I to be never, marketed better. Never That's either. right, JJ. And more about the tasty uh, succulent foods, because we're going to discuss all the football. Put it in your mouth. <laughs> now, what did we discuss? We discussed uh, Patrick Vieira's sacking at Crystal Palace. We did that a lot with uh, Ruben Pinder. Uh, what else do we have on here? Ah, a dissection of Heath and Heathland. What does it all mean? How much of that will be kept in? He'll be looking forward to hearing. <laughs> Antonio Conte had a strange weekend, didn't he? Said a lot of stuff. We talked about all of that. And then Spurs. Um, then there was a break. Oh, the quarterfinal draw for the Champions League. That's actually some very good games in the quarterfinal draw of the Champions League. Fun to discuss those, as well as our favourite video games, Romping versus Bowling. And that was a strange cut on account of something that happened <laughs> where there was no way of getting out without redoing the bit before. <laughs> but if you like to find a sort of roundabout way of doing things, but when you do it, you realise this was the best way. Why didn't I do this before? <laughs> you should visit The Athletic. Visit theathletic.com forward slash TIFO, theathletic.com forward slash TIFO. Because when you do, you'll realise that your life before was without meaning. Yes. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, there was so much today. We talked about so much today. But um, for now, I will leave you in the warm hands and the cool embrace of the little baby, <laughs> Sharon. <laughs> the tiny baby. Small little baby. Is Ruben Pender. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs> Arsenal 4. One Crystal Palace. Ruben Pinder. Now, I don't care about Arsenal. Let's not talk about them. Although they were impressive and we should begin this section by saying that not that many teams score that many goals against Crystal Palace this season. Um, having said that, the reason that we're discussing Crystal Palace is because their manager, whose name I've forgotten. Patrick Vieira. Patrick Vieira. It's no longer the podcast, their manager. Yeah. Um, as soon as they are fired, uh, they lose relevance to me. And that's why I forgot that one. But uh, Patrick Vieira, of course, lost his job last week after a very a turgid run of form, mm -hmm. I think you can call it. Mm -hmm. um, it's a bit of an odd one, though, isn't it? Because, I mean, the elements of them last season, they were superb. They had a great finish to the season. Um, but uh, the, tur the turgid run has really done the deed here, it seems. Yeah. Um, he has been stitched up a little bit by the fixture schedule because there's a, there was a run of games against very good teams. And now um, he's been sacked just before a run of games against teams all in the bottom eight. So if you were to mix that up and, you know, the, the losses were, you know, broken up by the occasional win, then it might not look as bad. Mm -hmm. But this terrible run of form has led to a horrible loss of confidence and momentum. And watching them is quite a bleak experience at the moment. Well, I was going to ask, you probably watch them as many weeks mm. as, you, as you can. Um, and it's, it, I've heard it said by others that it's not really clear what they're trying to do with the ball. I mean, I suppose that's the reason that there was the stretch of three games where they didn't have a shot on target mm -hmm. and why they've only scored four goals this year so far. Yeah, um, and the same thing happened at Nice, um, as you guys mentioned last week. Like um, When nobody, Patrick Vieira was manager of yeah, Nice. Yeah, nobody is quite sure what his philosophy is. So last season, um, Conor Gallagher arrived from Chelsea on loan. We got new centre-backs who were young, mobile, good with the ball, and that allowed us to completely change our style of play because the centre-backs could run backwards, whereas like Scott Dan and Gary Cahill couldn't. So we went from parking the bus to playing really aggressively and Gallagher was completely key to that. Um, and it seems kind of simplistic and reductive to boil it down to with Gallagher good, without Gallagher bad. But even last season, when he wasn't allowed to play against Chelsea in the cup semi and the two league games, and he had like a little period of injury, 
we were nowhere near as good. Mm. And then James MacArthur has also missed the whole season with injury. Um, we didn't really replace Gallagher. So it you've got Jeffrey Schlupp starting in midfield most weeks. Mm. And that's, would he start for anybody else in the league? Probably not. So there are some good players in the team, as we've discussed beforehand. Elise Zaha, you know, Gay Anderson, Decore. But there's no depth. We're yeah. always one injury away from James Tompkins or Joel Ward or Jeffrey Schlupp or Jordan Ayew sure. or Luka Milivojevic playing. And none of them would play for any other teams in the league. So, yeah. He didn't mention Eze though in mm. that list. He's not having the best year. He's gone off the boil. He has. And a part of that is, well, Vieira, had, Vieira didn't seem to trust him to do his defensive duties mm. as like the most advanced midfielder. Um, so he kind of became an impact sub, but that impact diminished over time. And I wonder how much of it is down to that very long Achilles injury that he had, where maybe his explosive burst of like a few yards or his agility has kind of suffered. But he came on against Brighton and looked really short of any confidence and just like mm. couldn't couldn't retain the ball at all. Um, so that's not ideal. It's worth saying, uh, John McKenzie, we talked about this just before we started recording, um, that the difference between this season and last season seems to largely be Conor Gallagher. You said, how can it be that it's just one player? Do you want to discuss that here? Well, I w remember being fairly sceptical about Patrick Vieira as an option. Um, and so when something like this season happens, I can just sort of sit back a bit smug and be like, well, you know, I was a bit, I was always a bit sceptical of Patrick Vieira. But I went it back and sound had a look. like you. It does, do doesn't it? Yeah. I, I went back and, and looked at the numbers from last season and Palace were pretty much... The, in, like the sixth best team in the in the league according to the underlying numbers. Now the underlying mm -hmm. numbers are the underlying numbers, but they've gone from being like a very competent team to to being a team who looked devoid of ideas. And I I, I maybe maybe I'm tactics pilled, but I don't think that I, I just can't bring myself to think that one player can have that amount of effect on on a team that that when they aren't I mean I, I agree that Gallagher is an important player for them last season but I think your tactics pilled I mean do you remember <clears> that <throat> period of time under Ole Gunnar Solskjaer whenever you know the odd game that Bruno Fernandes would miss they were like a completely different team but sometimes it's about do you not think sometimes it's about a bit more than the system sure sure but when it comes to Gallagher I mean he's not he's not giving you that necessarily that attacking upside in quite the same way right he I, he was much more important in terms of the, the energy out of possession and uh, and holding things together in that way. Um, and I think that what's happened is that this team is now much less able to do things with the ball than it was. And I, I, I can't see it simply being down to Gallagher himself. But um, it's, it's kind of what Gallagher represents. It's mm, the energy that yeah. he put in and other players as well. And I, there's maybe an element of us being worked out a little bit because last season Palace were new to playing that kind mm. of football. And now people kind of they've worked out what Palace did last season, and without Gallagher, it's a lot easier to stop. I guess there's there's definitely a, an aspect I think in the Premier League where you get a year maybe of playing away before teams start recognizing what you're doing. But also I think when you're a team who people expect to be in the bottom half, they play against you as though you are a bottom half team. And then as soon as you're a team like Palace, then who have a good season and and the numbers say that you're actually a top half side. Um, oppositions change the way they play against you. They can start sitting deeper and they can start stop giving you um, space. It's something that's happened with Newcastle this season, for example. In the first half, yeah. people didn't expect Newcastle to be Champions League contenders. And now I think we're seeing Newcastle having to grind out results because they are being forced to play in a different way as well. That reminds me of when Leicester won the league. It didn't seem to happen to them. <laughs> yeah. Everybody still played against them as if they could break them down and batter them. Mm. And, le and, it, and it worked, so... but. Maybe, yeah. maybe everyone's learnt from that. I listened to Dom Fifield on the Athletic Football podcast last week. This was actually just before Vieira lost his job. It was one of those podcasts that they recorded uh, beforehand and released and then within probably <laughs> half an hour Vieira had actually gone. Uh, but the content is still very relevant before as it, as it was afterwards. He said that he thought last season their cup run and the way in which they finished the season kind of obscured... Um, the murkier elements of their performance. Would you agree with that? Yeah, hundred percent. There was a there was a run in the middle of the season where we didn't win for ages, but nobody cared because yeah. we beat Everton four 0 in the FA Cup yes. a, a year ago today, actually. Um, and how far we've come? Yeah. Well, well how, how far we've regressed? How far you've, I regressed. How far you've come back I'm in the wrong backwards, direction? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's all a matter of perspective. But yeah, I mean, I suppose, because for clubs like Palace who have literally never won a major trophy trip to Wembley and the potential of another FA Cup final 
makes up for not winning in the league. Yeah. And it's there's scary parallels to Pardew's time at Palace as well. He lasted a bit longer, but we went on a dreadful run of league form under him, but we still got to an FA Cup final. So people were like, eh, well, this is actually worth it. Mm. Um, but yes, that is true. So we, it's not just now that the problems have arisen. They're, yeah, sure. Yeah. So we no, were... Uh, no, you're going to do it. No, go on, you go. I was going to no, say... No, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a very... Everyone, mo- I can get in John's camera view for the first time. Hold on. <laughs> Start talking, John. Once upon a time, there lived a young boy named Joe... <laughs> That's fun. That's a very mop it. What were you, like you going to say? Just say something about. I was going to say we, we were chatting yesterday while we were, while <laughs> we were playing our favourite game, Rocket League. Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And I was suggesting to you the idea that maybe certain managers who this come is in, what he does, by the way, when we're trying to play games and have fun, is he suggests ideas to me. Do you know? He has big thoughts and then he tries to communicate them to me and I go, yes, John. And then we lose the yes. game that we're playing. Do try to save that goal <laughs> instead of yeah. pontificating. But please pontificate here. This I, is the appropriate yeah. uh, environment. It is, isn't it? We're yeah. not going to give up any goals no. here. But um, well. yeah, I was, And I'd be interested in your thoughts on this because I was saying that there's some, it seems like some managers come into a club and they give a level of freedom to players that they've not had before. And in the, in the short term, that can be a good thing because... Uh, obviously, they're used to playing in really strict uh, structures, and it's nice to just be a little bit more free. But the problem is, is that as time goes by, they lose those structures because they're not being coached in those structures, and so things fall away. And I wondered if you think there's any element of that happening with Hodgson having a fairly strict st- um, structure, and then Vieira coming in being a little bit more free, changing things up a little bit, and then enjoying the benefits of Hodgson's structure, but the benefits of Vieira's freedom as well at the same time. Do you think there's anything in that? Yes, I hadn't thought about it like that before, but that's exactly what happened. Wilfred Zaha last season was actually smiling when he was playing football rather than shouting a lot um, because he was finally able to attack and he had a little bit of help and he had a, finally had another winger to take the attention off him like he had in Balassi. When Elise arrived, everybody stopped tripling up on him. So he could have some fun. It felt like he had the team that he deserved. And now everything sli- slowly started to go backwards a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think in the game against Arsenal, there was a moment. Now I never question his attitude or how much he cares. But there was a moment just before Arsenal's first goal when Ben White intercepted the ball and he just stood still. And I kind of understand how <laughs> fed up he is, yeah. um, given that exactly what you just explained has happened. Yeah. What do you think, JJ? I think Crystal Palace just aren't very good and they've, they're stuck at a level where they can't really get out of it. They have no money, they don't invest. Until this weekend, they were only three points off, now they're six points off where they were last season. Yeah. I think Hodgson put principles in place that made them very hard to beat. I totally agree with that point, that when you come in as a different manager, you then benefit from that. I think Roberto Martinez inherited a team that was really well drilled solidly at Everton, I think, and then tried to make them whatever they were afterwards, and then it just fell apart. And he's, I think he's, that's one other example I can think of off the top of my head. Um... I think the players that like Zaha, Alise and Eze, I think they're all really good individual players, but I don't think they're of a yet of a level where they would make a top six team better. So therefore they're kind of middling. And Zaha they, might or might have done over the last couple of years. In the but, past, like he's yeah. there was a while ago I thought he'd be good enough for one of the very best teams. But Arsenal certainly seemed to try to get him. For he's a while, missed yeah. his window now, he, though, hasn't yeah. he? He did that and didn't do that, right? Yeah. Well, he, he at, at, a very, at a very young age, though. Yeah. I would we say, don't, like, we don't talk about that year. That didn't happen. <laughs> but regardless, what they've always lacked, or for the last few seasons, is lacked someone who can really finish chances, the striker, because all clubs miss a player who's like that because they're very expensive yeah. and Palace don't invest money in those sorts of players. W- worth saying to add to that point as well, that whilst I- I'm sure fans wouldn't be disappointed necessarily that Christian Benteke specifically had left, he wasn't replaced. Uh, well, Matata, <laughs> who's rubbish. But there's, oh, there's, so there's more, there's more. <laughs> um, like Conor Gallagher, I think, is a, a not an enormous miss. They look at Fulham without Joe Polinio this season. I think uh, John's watched a lot of them recently, but to, to me, they're not the same. Mm. And you just see it in the you see it in his absence. I think an awful lot. Yeah. And Gallagher, in terms of uh, energy, yes, that's a thing that we all know he does and he brings that. But he was one of the top receivers in the final third, like last yeah, season. Yeah. I mean, he received the ball in the box more than like most Palace players. He was essentially an extra forward. So you miss that. It's enormous at that level. Palace are just one of these teams that are stuck between 12th and 20th. If they get a few games that go their way, last season they beat Man City, I think, twice. So they drew once and beat them once. Mm -hmm. That shouldn't happen. Beat them away. So that's against what should have happened. If they hadn't won those two games, they'd be exactly where they are now and you're thinking that Vieira's not that good. So a lot of lucky results disguise how good a manager actually is. 
Vera might be fine, but there's very little that you can do. Like If you wonder what his philosophy is, what are you meant to do with this team? You can only really do a couple of things. Make them hard to break down and hit the counter-attack, which is what they've done forever under Hodgson and will do again when he inevitably comes back in. Or you try and adapt them to make them more attacking and then you see loads of chances and you end up where you are right now. Like The PPDA, yeah. passes per defensive action, a unit to measure how good a team is at pressing or how intensely they press. Yeah. It uh, shows that they went up immediately after Hodgson because that's what Vieira wanted and people liked that and you saw the change. The PPDA went up. It did. And then this season, as soon as they, cause the start of their season, they, had, they played like uh, Man City, Arsenal, <laughs> Liverpool, yeah. uh, Newcastle, Brentford... Mm. And I think never on maybe Brighton as well at the start of the season. The PPBDA went down. Uh, it it <laughs> dropped off a cliff. Down. It yeah. fell off a cliff. So, so it, I mean, it actually went up because that's the higher number, the worse. You right. Are, right. It went. Yeah. So it's changed. Then it's coming back round. You would see that probably change again because the, the fixtures will change. Where will it go now? Up again? Down again? Well, Hodgson will probably come in and then it will probably stay low because you'll want to wow. see loads of possession and space so they can attack it with those players and it, you're sort of trapped watching that. This is the this is the the real question you've uh, you've. Uh, uh, stumbled onto the JJ Bull. The only manager so far as we start recording that's really being actively linked with Palace is Roy Hodgson, Ruben Pinder, who he seems like a lovely chap. He does. Uh, 75 years 75 old, I think. 75 years old. Obviously, he'd done a good job there in, in the past. I think uh, you know what you will get. Mm-hmm. Um, let me just tell you before you speak about that, their list of upcoming fixtures here. I think this will be instructive. Uh, at home to Leicester, away to Leeds... Away to Southampton, at home to Everton, away to Wolves, and at home to West Ham. That feels, like, important. (laughs) Yeah. It's terrifying because all of those games, a lot of fans are like, oh, we'll be fine, look at this run of fixtures we've got. But all it's of just those six six pointers in a row. Yeah, yeah. All of those teams are also looking at the game against us, though. Going, that's three easy points. Yeah. So, but this is kind of why people feel like Vieira was slightly harshly done because he didn't get that run. Yeah. Um, and I don't think Hodgson is the right manager to attack those games because we've actually been defensively okay barring the four goals conceded against Arsenal like yeah. there was a lot of one nil losses in the last couple of months um or a few like one all draws we need more goals and yeah. I'm not sure Hodgson is going to do that but he doesn't have that much to work with because no. Mateta as we've established is not great but just briefly going back to a point JJ made about like the finances we don't sell players for profit ever the last player we sold for a profit I think was Aaron Wan-Bissaka to Man United yeah. like four years ago almost. and it does seem like you want to buy him back or yeah. at least at times it has um, and that because all the money that we've spent on players like Gehi and Anderson Decore, Elise, Eze that's created a very decent starting eleven, but there's no depth to it at all Yeah. so we're uh, like as I said earlier the, the, the starting eleven kind of masks how bad the squad is uh, yeah. overall um, that's relevant so, too to yeah. Vieira because then the, 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 a lot of the I did a video on Crystal Palace last week when Vieira got done and a lot of the research with, with Matt Wisnam right the uh, athletics Crystal yes. Palace writer yeah. he gave yeah. us some colour which is yeah. very useful um, a lot of the, the feedback from other Palace fans is that uh, sure enough Vieira wanted to play the way he wanted to play but then when he was missing certain players like uh, Anderson who's a ball playing centre back really important for how they want to build out from the back and you put James Tompkins in you can't do it you can't play the way you want to play out from the back suddenly so you can't really play the way or build the way you want to play which affects every yeah. other bit like dominoes and so then it's a bit like when Seb can't make it for the podcast so we have to get Ruben like the drop off or like the change in approach we have to take is just <laughs> because he can't play it out from the back <laughs> you exactly. he's, got to, he's got to lump it long yes exactly that's yeah. exactly the point I was going to end on that point but then that's the problem so then people want him to be more pragmatic and change but if you are a manager and want to impose your philosophy on a team you want to stick to your principles but if the players you've got can't do that what happens? You start losing and you look like an idiot for not winning the game. That's right. And yeah. so then for That's you, and me, yeah. you don't see the philosophy yeah. and then you don't win games. So then what's the point? Yeah. And there's no scope to really have anything other than a very basic philosophy, I think, if you're a team at the bottom half of the table. That's the problem, right? Because if you want to improve... It, you know, you're set in this my situation. My philosophy is life is futile. Yeah, well, it, we should all stop. That's it, my it, philosophy. It yeah. <laughs> but if you're Palace, for example, you have a good season, you finish in the top half... What what do you do? You don't have the money to because the idea then is well we've got to this point we can now develop our play style into what like more possession. But style. we know okay. it is John. It's winner stays on. <laughs> yes, winner stays on. No, once you get to that point, you can't get any further. But until you bring in better players, technically, and better players, technically, somebody. yeah, you either sell players on and bring 
better players in, which is not which is never going to work in the long run because all you're doing then is just churning and, and you have yeah. to sell the good players on to bring in your other next good player with, with risk attached. Or you have someone who becomes your sugar daddy and you spend a lot of money and then suddenly you can buy players of technical quality, bring in a manager to do that. So if you're a team like West uh, uh, Crystal Palace, what do, you, what, do you do, what do you do? Like The best chance you have is being a solid mid-table side and that is going to rely on really, really smart like ownership, managerial, or you get one like run where you get a high up the table yeah, exactly. and then you get picked apart because yeah, other yeah. people. Are, I was thinking this like, with well, Spurs. Brighton, I was right. thinking this with Spurs earlier, um, and the same sort of thing where like a lot of what you need, like what Antonio Conte is talking about. I'm sure we'll talk about this later. Is, I want to talk about Spurs. Okay, well, just like, really briefly, yeah. Stolen Palace is that the players he seems to want, like nasty players, are the ones with character, the ones that Crystal Palace have, but. Uh, he doesn't have those players, so he doesn't he can't play the way he wants to. He has quite mm. good technical players, which uh, would mean you should probably play them in a different sort of way. Whereas Palace, what they tend to need, because they're always stuck at this level, is good characters who maybe lack some of the technical stuff. You yeah. can get away with having a couple of them, like Zaha and maybe Elise, but then all the other team does is kick them off the pitch and they can't play. And so mm. if all your creativity is from wide areas, the only way you can get the ball in the box is from crosses and you don't score if you don't got a guy in the middle... And so life is futile. Yeah. Well, life is futile. And indeed, let's, uh, let's round this section off by uh, looking, uh, just checking the, uh, the sort of best odds for the next Palace manager to see what kind of names we have here. Who will the Eagles swoop for? Roy Hodgson is one to six right now. Uh, Paddy McCarthy. He took, he took charge on Sunday. Yeah. Okay. Former captain. I didn't know who that he was. He was the uh, under-21s coach. Okay. Mm. Adi Horta. Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah, that's exciting. Ralph Hasenhutl. Okay. And Jesse Marsh, <laughs> Marcelo Bielsa, <laughs> who's on every list. I would like to see James Tompkins try to play murder ball. Yeah, that I mean, that would good. be fun. Uh, now, uh, all the way down. Well, you can get 33 to 1 on this. Thomas Tuchel. Oh, I think that's... <laughs> <laughs> he fancies a bit that's of a change. That's a new challenge, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Listen, I saw Palace Pochettino on, on the list last mm. week. I saw Pochettino at yeah? 14 to 1 at one point. Really? Yeah, which well, obviously won't happen. living in London. This is, but, this is an interesting he? question, though, right? Because we've got... Unai Emery at, at Villa, and we've mm. got Hulan Lopetegui yeah. at, at Wolves. Like, is it, is it, there is, is the it chance. Impossible? We it's are not impossible. Palace are not um, an attractive prospect for managers like that, though. Like Villa and Wolves are. Yeah, I suppose they've got better squads, more money. Yeah, they live nearer the countryside mm. as well. Yeah, you know. is that a factor? South London is wonderful. Say so. I'm not saying South London isn't wonderful. Have you ever been to Thornton Heath? Yeah. Where's Thornton Heath? Like near Selhurst, where we play. No. No. Is it, are there trees there? It's a nice place. Are there yeah, trees? Some nice trees, yeah. Oh. And grass. Nice I think it would be a big Park. watery bit as well, but it's a heath. Mm. It sounds like it would be. Yeah. I know Heath, that's not what Heath means, but I think there'd be a big <laughs> pond it means somewhere. It's a hill, doesn't it? There'd be a pond where it's mysterious murders happen, I think. Yeah. Doesn't sure. Heath mean like has Heather on it? That's how I think of it. I think it means there are mysterious murders. I think so too. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, mysterious murders. Um, I guess that's a good way of wrapping up that segment, yeah. isn't it? Um, let's before we go to a break, let's discuss Spurs quickly, um, as you initiated there, uh, uh, JJ Bull, because um, very bizarre over the weekend. I mean, we can start with saying Southampton three three Tottenham Hotspur, which is uh, interesting in and of itself. Ward Prowse uh, scoring a, a last minute penalty there. Um, but the the real drama occurred after the game in uh, post-match interviews, but largely in the post-match press conference, where Antonio Conte appeared to blame everyone and everything apart from himself. I haven't got the quote. Can you dig out the quote for me, Steve, so I can read that in, in a moment? Because oh, it's long, though. <laughs> it, no, well, just, I'll, pick, I'll pick the choice uh, bits as, as, as you guys chat about this. But um, we, we ha John and I have a friend who's a Spurs fan. We ch chatted to him about this last night. And he said, aside from how he feels about uh, tactics and the system and winning, as a fan of the team, Conte has to go because he, he's massively disrespected the team. He said he hates him now more than he ever hated Jose Mourinho, which, is, which must be a lot. I mean, what do you think? Is it OK afterwards to, to, to say all those things that I haven't got to hear, to here to say yet, but I will say after you've said whether it's okay or not to say. Well, uh, I've, I've just started reading um, How to Win Friends and Influence People, right? Yeah. And it talks a lot about how uh, like criminals <laughs> who do bad things will often blame everyone except themselves. They'll never right. look inwards. Conte's a criminal. No, but no. this is the point is that like, people often fail to look inwards and see what's wrong with, yeah. you know, never blame themselves. Uh, which is oh look I've got the quote Steve put them in shall oh, I read, shall I read well, them for a bit of structure yeah here? sure we'll come back to where they are yeah. so he described his players as selfish 
Um, he said that uh, Spurs could change the manager, but the situation cannot change. Uh, he said that his team don't want to help each other. He said Tottenham's story is this. 20 years, there is this owner, and they've never won something. Why? He said, <laughs> uh, he said the fault is only for the club. For every manager that, that's here, I've seen the managers that Tottenham have had on the bench. You risk to disrupt the figure of the manager and... Uh, and to protect a other situation in every way. I mean, also, he said, until now, I tried to hide the situation, which he obviously wasn't doing a very good job. Um, but uh, it's a bit mad, isn't it? Spurs did come back with this quite funny uh, uh, statement, sort of trying to say, oh, no, he didn't mean us. <laughs> he meant, like, something else. He wasn't talking about Daniel Levy. He meant, like, a different thing. You mis misunderstood it. Well, on one hand, I think... He needs to look outwards and see that there are other factors of where, why it hasn't quite worked. On the other hand, mm. I can sort of completely agree <laughs> with right. what he's saying. Do you? Well, the players but he then has. Why isn't he doing as well as Pochettino did? If it's if it's all the club. Well, look at Pochettino they... had a team. He had like Alderweireld, Vertonghen, who at their peak. He had the France captain Loris at his peak. He mm. had Harry Kane, one of the best strikers in the world, at his peak. He bought many yeah, of those players. No, and 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 he no one was on, saying on, these Antonio, players were good until he was there. That's true. And also Antonio Conte. Spurs have spent nearly two hundred million pounds under Antonio Conte. On nonsense, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, like, how much of that is is? I don't know. I don't know how much. Much the the club are buying players that the managers actually want. Jed Spence got bought for like twenty five million or something like that. And yeah. Like or Ryan Ryan Cessna I think he was a club signing, wasn't he? That sounds like there's a few of them yeah. they've got there. So like Conte has a, a squad that is good enough to be amongst the top eight or whatever. But as Conte pointed out, there's a load of teams that are going for those four s slots. Um, yeah. Conte just sounds like Mourinho now. Like it's not his fault, and but he could play a different way maybe. But Conte mm. plays this way, and he knows that's what wins. And this guy's a serial winner. Like everywhere he goes, he wins stuff and playing in a certain way. I would say I I, I have to dis disrespectfully dis disagree with you because uh, you know the, uh, like the 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 main notion here it seems to be that Tottenham haven't won a trophy for twenty years, right? Like we had a conversation two weeks yeah. ago about what the what the actual value of a trophy is beyond the 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 league or the champion, the Premier League or the Champions League, for example. So there's there's that. Also, for large periods of the last ten years. Tottenham have outperformed their wage budget, right? They just they just have. They overperform in miles, yeah. Yeah, so like the idea that because they haven't won a trophy means that they're a failure club is is it absolutely stupid? I, I agree. mean, it's literally the stupid. The fans enjoyed it for a long time when Pochettino mm. was there. And once he, when he left the club, the, I remember seeing them lose to Newcastle at yeah. uh, the new stadium and they were dreadful. They had no width, no pace, yeah. no nothing. And if that was Pochettino's squad building. I don't get it why everyone loves him so much because well, towards, but towards the end of his time there yeah sure and whether that's his fault whether he's buying Lo Celso and not players he actually definitely needs in these positions or whether that's the club doing it I don't mm. I don't know the insides exactly I forgot that JJ hates Pochettino I forgot about it's his, not that, his, I, I his think agenda I think with gets Pochettino a lot of... they literally had like two or three windows where they didn't buy anyone yeah. like I yeah. can't even like, get my head Lucas around it was Lucas Moura that. broke that duck of not signing anyone <laughs> yeah. didn't it? Lucas Moura yeah. you go through a lot of Pochettino signings and not all like as I say with a lot of managers not Everyone's very good, but this is my point. I don't know if it's Pochettino or the club doing it. Yeah. Whereas like Conte's come in as one of the best or most highly regarded managers in the world, and he was before. Yeah. <laughs> before he started to melt down. And they've given him tens of millions, hundreds. They've of given lots of, of money, but again, is he getting exactly what he wants in, or what's? Well, I mean, I mean Clint, Leon was his player. Perisic is very clearly a, a Conte signing, and for he was example. signed for free though. Pedro yeah. Pedro Porro, who is what yeah. maybe the most expensive, no, one of the most expensive wing backs of all time, team. is yeah. cl very clearly a Conte signing. Who's also, you know. It could be a club, though, because you look at who the available upcoming wing backs are. And Porro's I, did, been I on the, think Pedro Porro's pro probably like. I'm not, I'm not saying. Porro's been the, on like Scouts list for years. Of course. Years, I'm not yeah. saying he wouldn't have been on the. the every top uh, elite club will yeah. have every good player on every scouting list. So that's yes. not really. That doesn't mean it's a club signing. Uh, but I would have thought that buying a very kind of specific technical wing back. It's most likely to be a Conte signing when you have Conte as your manager. Well, that is sort of relevant because then you look at who the next manager would be and who's going to come in. And then are you going to bring in someone who will suit the players they've got just now? Like Poro mm. is more of a wing back from what I've seen of Poro. He's more of a wing back than a full back. He is you, a wing you, back. You could play yeah. him there, right? Yeah. So that means you've probably got to play him higher up unless you're playing a Klopp yeah. wing back, back four system. Let, okay, let me ask you this. Let me ask this in two stages, right? Yes. Forget about where the football and whether Conte should be there for the rest of the season or not off because of that. Yeah. Is it okay? Okay, as a manager to say those things about your players and the owner and the club and the sort of culture of 20 years of failure after a game where you draw 3-3 with a team that can't score a goal and a bottom of the league is it okay to say that and keep your job 
or are you supposed to and and again i know we uh, we should acknowledge antonio conte had a very difficult year there's nothing i have nothing against him personally i i, I hope he yeah. is recovering from his surgery and i'm sorry for the bereavement that he, that he has incurred this uh, this year of course that makes all of these conversations difficult but at the same time, is it okay to, to say all those things and then keep your job? Like that's Probably enough not, to be said. Because anyway, you, right? yeah, because you can. It, it's damaging to the club's reputation. It makes them look yeah. stupid, and uh, it, okay. it is damaging for PR. So, so that's now, one thing. Forget about that yeah. and just think about the football. Is it is it better to, given that his contract expires at the end of the season anyway? I'm pretty sure. Is it better to just keep him for the rest of the year uh, because Newcastle look like they have less of a chance of finishing fourth than they did earlier in the season everyone else fighting for that fourth position maybe Liverpool coming back into it like this an argument is a bit tough Brighton Brighton of course could do it as well is it uh, better to keep him and then just get a new manager in the summer where, or, or is it better to pay the money now to get rid of him and try Spurs and Spurs is another? thinking it has to be long term what they're doing they went from Mourinho who in that documentary said all the same things that Conte is saying mm -hmm. exactly the same stuff yeah like they're not nasty enough to so the can't play in that way. So then you've got to play in this. You got to play a more attacking way. You need to bring in a manager who does that. Yes. And then what you'll find probably is the same sort of issues where the some of the players they've got don't have that winning nasty streak in them. Maybe that's what the thing is. But you don't, do you need that? I mean, like Guardiola's I got away know. with it. Like what do you think? I, I feel like people talk about Spurs in a weird way that ignores what Pochettino did a right. lot because the squad is not that similar anymore to. I don't know. I just I don't like the idea that there's this inherent curse running through the club that yeah. makes all the players soft. I mean, it's just Kane and Son and Dyer, isn't it? Pretty, and Lloris. Pretty much, yeah. It's those four. Uh, but like Pochettino got them to a Champions League final. They came playing Musa Sissoko and Harry Winks in central midfield. Winks, yeah. yeah. Um, they came second uh, the year that Conte won the league at Chelsea, mm -hmm. and they 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 came third the season before that. But they were like second all season. So like, it's not a. It, the club isn't cursed if Conte and Jose are saying all the same things and blaming the players for being too soft I feel like that speaks to their managerial mm. flaws that they yeah. have I mean it's a fairly recent thing with Conte as well because it's kind of the first place he's really failed in the league that I can think of sure as I don't know he, he's failing though he's pretty well, much yeah, doing they're okay. fourth, but you, you know what I mean like it's yeah. it's more <laughs> underwhelming than his Inter or his Chelsea they, and Mourinho's been kind of you know, at Premier League level with the top clubs, like mm. it was clear from his last in at Chelsea that it, he was a bad hire for Spurs. Sure. But it, it's, it's, it's not impossible to succeed with Tottenham. And the way managers speak, um, I feel like passes the buck a bit. And basically, mm. yeah, they should sack Conte now, give it Mason to the end of the season <laughs> and then uh, bring Poch back. I like how you got a lot more London when you said give it Mason. <laughs> give it Mason to the end of the season. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here's a point to make to you. John McKenzie. I feel like with Spurs and Daniel Levy, one criticism that I would have is that five, six years ago, under Pochettino, um, when you know they brought him in from Southampton and they unearthed loads of these great players, everyone talked about Spurs as like a system team and a, like a progressive, exciting team. And then everyone copied it, right? But Spurs went in the other direction. They hired Mourinho and Conte and now that they've got bigger revenues than Arsenal, they've built their stadium and they've we're here now, let's do a Galacticos thing, which obviously they're not actually doing. That's a massive, uh, massively um, uh, reductive thing to say. But you get my point, right? Like, weren't they kind of part there or thereabouts the originators of the kind of Premier League system thing and then they just left it? I think the chronology is important, right? When, when Pochettino comes in at Spurs, it's a very different club from what they are now. And I don't think Spurs would be here now in the way that they are if it weren't for Pochettino. And the reason why they've then gone, let's go for Mourinho, let's go for Conte, is because they... They can for the first the, time. Yeah, the way that Daniel Levy sees it is we were previously a mid-table side. Pochettino carried us to the next level. Now we're here and we can do what top table sides do, which is bring in really elite managers. But the problem for me is that they've they've done two things wrong one is that they've gone for a style of manager that doesn't reflect what Pochettino was doing yeah so they went for very very different coaches than, than Pochettino and the other thing uh, that they've done is that the, the the place I think the play style has maybe gone out of out of date and they've re, they've carried on bringing in the same sorts of managers through um, and so yeah there's that weird like progressive element where it's like oh they've they've gone for an exciting risky manager who isn't being touted by a lot of clubs. They brought him in, made him big, brought him to that elite level. And then they've sort of, because they've got there, they've said, well, now we can just go back to the the boring elite manager style of play, yeah. which is 
it doesn't matter until you're. It doesn't matter once you're there. You can do what you like, and you'll probably stay there. And I just don't know well, if that's here's, tr- true anymore. Here's a means of, uh, of, of uh, adding numbers to that. Uh, um, Martin Ziegler tweeted this uh, the other day. Uh, this is about the top six teams and the percentage of change in their wage bill from 2017 to now. The only team whose wage bill has increased more than Tottenham is Liverpool, which has gone up by 75 percent in that time. Tottenham's has gone up from 127 million pounds in 2017 to 209 million, up 66 percent in that period of time. It's, That's, I mean, it's transformative. Isn't it's it? worth saying as well that that is much lower than a lot of the other elite sides. It's about 150 million below most of them. Um, so the, the yes. percentage change is it's obviously still more than Arsenal, though. More than Arsenal, yeah. It's but three Arsenal, million more than Arsenal. Arsenal have done, a, as, as you could watch a video about on our, uh, an illustrated channel, eh? Arsenal's finances. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Abhishek Raj. Yeah, they, they've, yeah, they've made a huge effort at uh, reducing their, their wage bill at um, yeah. Arsenal. So. And they've built a team that suits lovely football that is fun, both fun to watch and gets results, where it, uh, whereas Spurs yeah. have gone with the get results above entertaining football. Get them. Yeah. And so the players that Conte is moaning about, uh, he doesn't have the ones he needs to do what yeah. he wants to do, but they're not fun to watch. Mm. And uh, they're kind of stuck. Big ups, two, two upsides, though. Yeah, Pedro Porras scored a goal in this 3-3, which was a, a banger. Very nice. Yeah. Also, Perisic scored his first goal for the club as well. I did find it funny that both fullbacks scored uh, their first goal for the club. One of them was there for a good six months before the other one. But uh, Pedro Porro looks a good player. Also, uh, we haven't really got time to talk about it now, but quite interesting that since uh, Hugo Lloris has been injured, um, Fraser Force has come in. Bit of a change to how they play football where they have a goalkeeper who... Uh, keeps the goal. Keeps the goal. Is... <laughs> Reliable. He's a big. He's a big lad, isn't he? Big lad. Yeah. Fraser Force. Put him in charge for the rest yeah. of the season. Yeah. Eh? He fills more of the frame. Get him, and that's a good point. Would you do that, Ruben? Would you put him in charge? You point it to John now. Would not I him. point John? Uh, Fraser. <laughs> no, he's a small boy. Uh, would you, Fraser would you point me as Palace manager for the rest of the season? If you had to pick a Spurs <laughs> player to put in charge, genuinely have to think about that. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. Imagine that Ryan Mason wasn't available. Let's do this before we go to a break. Everyone can answer. If you had to pick a player to put in charge, don't say Harry Kane. Who would you pick? Oh, in the in the Player current Spurs squad, yeah. Um, ben Davis. Ben Davis. Yeah, that's actually fairly cultured. Interesting. Yeah, TJ, What about you? Hoiberg. You put Hoiberg. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Hoiberg for me. As is well. Hoiberg? Do you think Hoiberg is a good footballer? Yes. One hundred percent. He's a great yes. footballer. Yeah. Okay. So my <laughs> very quickly, my Spurs supporting friend who has wanted Conte gone for a very long time. Yeah. Hates Hoiberg and thinks he's is your just friend Pochettino. Bland rubbish. Hoiberg was like Guardiola's pet at Bayern Munich back in the day, and he had some really difficult family stuff, I think. And then his career didn't go quite the way he wanted it to. He was. I mean, there's a reason he must play every game. He was a brilliant. Reason, I think he was meant to be like the next like big six, the number six kind of player. And you can see like he's really hardy. Like when he plays, he's a uh, he works really hard. Yeah. Uh, he's I, the sort of player where in a in a uh, apologies to Tottenham fans more elite team in a good team where you want a player who doesn't do anything flashy but does everything right he's the player that starts to get the plaudits when you've praised everyone else where you go and by the way he just never puts a foot wrong I think Joyberg like adapts his game to those around him to mm. try and make the team work better so I think he could be a much better player than he is but he has to do other stuff to make up for the holes that yeah. left by their he's probably players. a victim of the stodgy style at the moment as well, yeah, in maybe, that sense. Yeah. He's been he playing in a team and midfield as well, which I think means people don't recognise like how. I mean, one, you have to cover a huge amount of, of ground yeah. and uh, etc. Especially in the Premier League, where everyone is overloading central midfields as well. So I feel like people don't give him the benefit of you know if you played him as a as a single pivot behind two eights, he he probably would. Look He's missing different. Benton yeah. Kerr now as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, also a uh, big Fraser Forster now in the England squad as a result of Is he? an injury. Yes, Pope he had to drop Pope, out. Pope's yeah. dropped out. So uh, Fraser Forster in the England squad. There you go. It's exciting, isn't it? It's good for England. Yeah, it's exciting. Okay. And uh, just before we go to a break, thank you to producer Steve here, uh, Heathland, the Cambridge Dictionary, which I've always thought is a poor dictionary. <laughs> I prefer the Oxford one. Um, the Oxford English Dictionary. I prefer, Oxford, urban, uh, urban's I prefer the Urban Dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> I'd hate to know what the Urban Dictionary would say about Heathland. Wow. Yeah. But uh, the Cambridge Dictionary <laughs> uh, says about Heathland, uh, defines as an area of Heath. Um, the same dictionary describes Heath as an area of land that is not used for growing crops, where grass and other small plants grow, but such where there heather. are... Such as Heather. Such as Heather. But where there are few trees... Or bushes. So a field, basically. Basically a field, And yeah. where many <laughs> murders happen. And where <laughs> many, many murders happen. That's Joe, right. could you please look up Heath um, and read out what Heath says? On Urban Dictionary. In Urban Dictionary, yeah. 
Do you know there's a pope called Urban? Oh, I can read it for there's you. There's a few popes called Urban. <laughs> but don't, oh, don't, don't read it first, just read it out loud before you even look at it. Read it out loud. Yeah, okay. We might not put this in the podcast. <laughs> okay. Heath is the name for a guy with brown hair, pretty eyes, sometimes wears glasses, gorgeous smile, and has a very nice penis with excellent sexual powers. <laughs> Used in a sentence, Oh, wow, I never thought I'd see a <laughs> as hot as Heath's. That's good. Yeah. Uh, Heathcliff. Heathcliff? Heathcliff. Yeah. From? From? Wuthering the, the cat. Wuthering, 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 height. Oh, that was hard. <laughs> there he goes. Break. Eh? It's break time now, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Isn't Heathcliff a cat? Is that a cartoon called Heathcliff? <laughs> ah, Heathcliff. We've returned from a break. What a lovely break that was. We just discussed more about Heath and his penis. Uh, <laughs> Champions League, a quarterfinal draw. Oh, this is a good one. I was excited when I saw this, uh, Steve Hankey, I was. Uh, now, let me just tell you what these games are, okay? I'm going to tell you what these games, what these games are now. Real Madrid-Chelsea. Oh, that's good, isn't it? Let's have a reaction from a different person each time I read one. John, you're next, and I want your real guttural reaction, okay? Benfica, Inter. Yes! Yeah, that is, that is a good one. That is a good one. Ruben, how about you? Man City, Bayern. Cool. It is a cool. Uh, oh, you got cool. a high bar for you now, JJ. What what can you do? I've come to you last because I believe in you, man. Okay, Milan, Napoli. Hey, hey, indeed. <laughs> hey, indeed. And uh, so stupefied is JJ Bull by that uh, because, of course, he, his hey refers to the fact that there are three Italian teams in the semi-finals mm. and actually through the route as well. I don't they face each other. I saw the route. Let me just get the route up because uh, they've yeah. already defined the route. Yeah, if yeah. In, if Inter beat Benfica, they will play the one of the other Italian teams. Yes, yeah, Napoli, AC Milan, is? Porto. Uh, sorry, not Porto. AC Milan, um, <sighs> Napoli, thingy and thingy. Inter, and Benfica, Benfica and Inter. Inter it. Yeah. I, they're all on the same side of the draw. I'm just going to get that just to just not because I don't believe you, but because I can't understand what you're saying when you all say it. The, the draw has been time. split into like. The, the powerhouses and the underdogs. Right, there's so three Italians Benfica on Inter one versus side. one of Napoli or, yeah. or Milan. Yeah. Ah, so, the, there's, so there's three and, Italian teams on one side. Unless of the draw. Benfica make it to the final, we're going to have an Italian team in the in the final. That's what we're saying. Yeah. yeah. yeah I think Benfica will be, be the first Inter. time in yeah. six years oh. since Juve in 2017. Well, yeah, the last time an Italian team won the Champions League was like what, 2010. 2000? Benfica yeah, Napoli in the same uh, Jose's Inter. 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 Yeah. 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 Juve have lost a few finals. Well, let's then. let's start by talking about Benfica because um you are a Heath for Benfica. <laughs> yeah. Yeah? I think I have a very nice penis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about that penis. What, what's the shape? What's the kind of shaft length? It's a diamond shape. What isn't about it? the size of the the size and, and rotation of the girth of the head? Benfica are absolutely great. Mm. I really like watching them. They have good players throughout. There are they're one of those teams that like Monaco in twenty seventeen. They'll get picked apart probably after this season. You get Gonzalo Ramos up front, who's yeah. got a hat trick in the World Cup. Remember him? He's yeah. great. Uh, then you've got Antonio Silva, who's an uh, academy graduate, come through in centre back. He's at the next Ruben Diaz. Be next to Otamendi, he'll remember. Grimaldo, Alex Grimaldo at left back, is one of the best in Europe. Yeah. The goalkeeper's all right, which is useful. Yeah. Uh, in the midfield, they've got uh, Florentino Luis, who's a, a Brazilian player who didn't make the squad for the Brazil thing. A lot of people were upset because he's done very well this season. Right. They're missing Enzo Fernandez, who's a big part of what they've done so well. Um, and then they've got either uh, David Neres, who used to play for Ajax, or uh, F- uh, Rafa Silva, who plays behind the striker. And then they've got yeah. wide forward wingers who. Uh, are also very useful as well. And you've got Joe Mario, who's having the season of his life, as I yeah. kept saying in the video, because people kept saying that. Well, let's, a lot of penalties. let's talk about their talent factory of the past as well. Yes. It's quite an quite incredible list there. Have you got that in front of you, JJ? Do you want to read that or do you want me to read it? No, I haven't got it, but I can... Well, I'll tell you, Darwin Nunez, yeah. Ruben Diaz, Enzo Fernandez, Joao Felix, uh, Edison... Cancelo, Bernardo Silva... Joao Cancelo, Bernardo Silva and Edison. Di Maria... Oh, yeah. That is, and Di, well, was Di Maria? Well, Di Maria was a signing was and then signing. he went on. So this is everything yeah. they do. Is Not only do they bring through these amazing players, but they also have a great scouting network and they find players in markets where they're maybe not ready for that big jump just yet. Bring them in, they develop them and then put them out for big money. So yeah. Di Maria went from Benfica to become a star at Real Madrid straight away. Uh, there's plenty of examples. Darwin Nunez is an example of that. They brought him in and then... This is quite literally on this Luis. list though is like the, Luis, yeah. some of the most expensive players ever in their position, right? Like Enzo yeah, Fernandez yeah. is an example of that. Ruben Diaz was extremely expensive. Joao Felix was, when he was signed, it was uh, over 100 million euros. Joao Cancelo is like, what, just was 60, 60 million was the, yeah. was the if, if Bayern wanted to keep him was what they would have to pay, which I don't think they're going to. Bernardo Silva would go for a huge they're amount Man of money. Manchester City players, so they're all 50 million each. Yeah. Right? So Edison 50 Well, and, and Darwin, Darwin Nunez was extremely expensive as well, right? Mm. I mean, that is... 
The, the academy is interesting as well. There's a, a video on our, not a rival, a friendly podcast in The Athletic's yeah. Athletic podcast. Anyway, there's an article in The Athletic as well yeah. talking about how Benfica's academy works. And uh, they've had lots of the staff in place for a long time. So uh, the, the way that they're supposed to be coached, these players, it is inherent and it's, it's really put in place and very strong because people in charge obviously have done that for a long time. Mm. But they don't have, like, I don't think of Benfica as having a set style of play something else I talked about in this video there's no Benfica way they just have good players who win stuff but one of the things to do in the academy is that all players should be able to play a, a minimum of three positions and so you see the players come through are all very good they're very fluid in different positions because they're fluent in it mm. they learn it as like a language at academy like Ruben Diaz is a defender obviously but you start as a striker went to midfield and defence Bernardo Silva multi-positional uh, Joao Cancelo, Joao Felix, yeah. could obviously play anywhere around. He could probably play in midfield if you put him. Yeah. Like, that's great. So they just build great technical players. And like tactics is very important in football, but that the technical level of a player is the most important thing, how good they are. So if you've got good coaches bringing through great players, then you can do whatever the hell you want with them in your tactic system if they're good players. Yeah. Well, it's working out for them so far in the Premier League uh, this season. They are currently after 24 games top, having won 21. <laughs> They've only lost two games all season. It's amazing. And, and one of them is on penalties in the cup against Braga, who they also was the other team they lost to. Wow, they've only lost one in the league, yeah. That's yeah. incredible. Incredible. Well, there we go. We look forward to, uh, to seeing Benfica face up against uh, Inter. What do you think about that, Clash? I mean, you think Benfica presumably have a really good chance, John? Yeah, I think so. I think both of the Milan sides sort of dragged their way through the, the round of 16. So yes. I think that Benfica will probably see this as one of the most winnable fixtures they could have got. So yeah, I think it'll be, it'll be fun to see how this one pans out. Great. Real Madrid, Chelsea. Yeah, that's a, an interesting, intriguing clash, isn't it? It is an intriguing it's, clash. Um, no, no one for the neutrals to root for in that one. No, that's yeah. true. It's, oh, Modric. It's, uh, yeah. yeah, everyone. There's not that yeah. much romance. God, I love Luka him. Modric being that good at 37. <laughs> yeah. It's ridiculous. I think I was watching the Clasico last night thinking about how good Modric is still. Like how long is how much longer? I need to go and see him play. Mm. Like I made it last night. I made up my mind that I need to go and see Real Madrid. Oh, I need to see Modric play. Yeah, you need if you to don't get to Madrid. Real Madrid this yeah. season, you have to go to Slavia Prague or wherever it's going to be. Where is it? That he, Croatia Zagreb is that where he started? Dinamo, out? yeah, yeah. Zagreb. Yeah. Well, he was in his first team. Like I did this thing. Ages Where's ago, better right? to go on holiday though? To be serious, I mean Zagreb maybe. What's well, there's but Zagreb's not where, where the coast is, and that's the best bit of Croatia, uh, right? Because it's more north in the country. Okay. So you want to have it's an unusually shaped country, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. But two two kind of interesting narratives, isn't there? There's the Chelsea Graham Potter one. Are they good now? Are they bad now? Who knows? I would. Re- I, do you know what? I can't think of uh, an outcome I would prefer than for Graham Potter to win the Champions League <laughs> with Chelsea. I really think that would be fun. Do, do we think that Graham Potter is weirdly adopting a Thomas Tuchel trajectory? Maybe he is. I feel like. I feel like Chelsea now play that three four three. That's going to say. Played. He's gone back to his system. He's gone he? back so. to his system. They're gonna. They could potentially. Sh- House of Champions League and then what do the fans do because the fans will be in a situation they'd where they'd be so confused yeah they'd be like we want to get rid of Graham Potter but he's done exactly the same as what Thomas Tuchel and by done. social contract we now have to keep him <laughs> for at least another nine months yeah. because yeah. that's how Did that works you see that clip of Graham Potter um, swearing oh, yeah, at like the, some fans event he no, looked so timid as he said the F word it was, I think it's because <laughs> of the accusations of him not being angry enough ah. in the thing he was like yeah and then we'll try and win the f- Champions League. <laughs> is, like it, is it exactly the same as that new uh, Jimmy Dimitri comedy on Netflix? Have you seen him? He does the stag do bit. Oh, no, no. You told me about this the <laughs> oh, other day, though. So funny. Actually, what happened is we went to the pub with your friends and you started that story. And then there was a wonderful moment about halfway through where you realised that it wasn't landing. And you saw. No, that was different. Was that a different story? That was a Jeff Goldblum joke I didn't tell about. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then you backpedaled for a little bit. That, but it made it better. That yeah, that well, was, it's that funny. That it's hard to tell someone why something's funny and you realise they're just sort of staring at you and not. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's been for you to stop talking, basically. Yeah, it takes courage to back out of a story like that. I yeah, I just lose confidence just in it. If it's not going it, to land, just give up, start bad, again, yeah. re-record the video. If it start again, you know. Mm. Real Madrid, hey. Speaking of how long till this podcast ends? <laughs> what about Man City Bayern? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's hard to know, really, isn't it? I mean, Bayern lost yesterday to Leverkusen. Man City seem to be hitting their stride mm. at the moment. I could see Chu promoting scoring the winning goal in this tie. Could you, could you see that? He, oh, he plays up front for Bayern Munich. I mean, it's not true. beyond the realms of possibility, is it? But I think he, he's actually quite good, isn't he? He's I having a, a, a purple patch, I hear. Yeah. This is the, this is the tactical tweakest of fixtures, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. This is going to be Nagelsmann and... and the most boring game, Pep. that's what you mean. No, no, they're going to be, they're going to be thinking. They, because it's not just that they're going to try and beat one another. They've also got to one-up them each other in terms It'll of... It'll be nil-nil after the, the first leg, the and these tactic. two will say it was a really interesting battle. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes when those games happen, I sort of think it's just, you know, you might as well just have the two of them 
uh, the managers go on the pitch on their own and, just and tell sit people what cross-legged they're... in the centre <laughs> circle opposite each other and just like put their hands on their head and play like chess, this, play on actual their fingers chess. on their temples. Yeah, play just chess, have, but with their eyes closed and say know? this is what we would have done if yeah. this game was played. And then the other and then it's decided like, on the underlying numbers. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, fine. Well, anyway, the point is that's really exciting. And um, Milan Napoli also is a uh, is going to be interesting. Milan not playing well at the moment. Napoli interesting then. Milan's well. one of Milan's best games of the season was against Napoli. Um, they lost, yeah. I think, but they actually played quite well against them. But yeah, a lot of water has passed under the bridge since then. So, and a lot of water has passed through my heath. There we go. <laughs> now, um, it was you, as you already mentioned, uh, JJ Bull, Barcelona two, one Real Madrid. Franquesier scoring a goal in ninety-two minutes. Um, I heard it was a bit of a stodgy affair. Uh, I thought it was really. Entertaining, interesting. By the end of the game, it had become a basketball game. They were right. just going from back to front, back to front. Uh, no, no real control over it. Mm. But it's so massive, right? Because Real started to push towards the very end of the game. It, it sort of changed who was in charge of it a lot. It changed who was in charge of the game a lot. And um, the middle part of the game, like towards the end of the first half, and then the start of the second half was kind of muddled. I think I'm trying to remember back to it now. Uh, Vinicius Junior, very, very good. Uh, Barcelona. R- Definitely miss Pedri whenever he's not there. You can mm. they're just not they're just not the same because very few players in the world can do what Pedri does. Gavi was half decent. The commentators kept talking about how Gavi wasn't getting involved. I thought he was doing loads. And they did this thing later on where Lewandowski was mostly playing in like the left half space. So they're trying to like pull him away, I think, from the other side of the pitch where uh, Militao was mm. for for Real. That's interesting. And they have, by the end of the game, when actually when Barcelona were, were then winning two one, they kept going. They weren't like being sensible and kind of control things down you had uh, Aru, Araujo I can't say his name properly yeah. Araujo uh, was trying to win a header 30 yards inside the Real Madrid he's, he's a right back yeah. that's just no control he's a big boy it's crazy. He? yeah he's a good player yeah. I, like Araujo, uh, I like the guy I can't say his name properly <laughs> but basically this is massive because Real had the lead Asensio runs off and celebrates it uh, and that could have changed everything because Barcelona sure enough are top of the league and they are much further ahead now but it hasn't been completely comfortable in the last little while. They've had a lot of quite fortunate one nil wins along the way as well. Mm. Really miss Pedri an awful lot, and uh, that would be great. But when that was the 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 narrative when they were winning, that was huge. Ancelotti's a genius. He's managed yeah. to win this sort of thing. And then they go and turn it over, and then that end to end thing leaves them loose at the back. And Kessie comes in and hits that final goal. It was brilliant at the very end of the game. Right. Good hit, wasn't it? Good hit. It really well placed. Yeah. yeah, I really liked Lewandowski's back heel pass to Balde. In All of it was good. Yeah, goal. it was really nice. Mm. Balde's come on something that he's 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 a really good player. At Balde, he's a, a La Masia graduate. He's come through playing basically as a winger, but starting at left back, and he sets up that goal to finish it. It, it was just. Uh, it was a good way to end that game but it's funny because then Ancelotti all the cameras just go to Ancelotti just yeah. chewing gum aggressively on the yeah. side of the pitch lane interesting well like you said Barcelona doing very well in the league at the moment they are now 12 points ahead of yeah. Real Madrid with 26 games played so I, I would you would expect that they are on the way to win however we know uh, in the near future, there will be more stories uh, related to more financial levers for Barcelona, still in a tricky situation uh, come the summer. One other interesting thing I read, uh, yeah, I think it was I read this last night, uh, that um, uh, Real Madrid are opening contract negotiations w- again with uh, Camavinga to try to secure him down, even on a longer term contract, and give him a wage boost, but also add um, a buyout clause to his contract of a billion euros mm-hmm. there are three Real Madrid players currently who have that buyout clause there's Vinicius Junior and Rodrigo can you guess who the third player is do you Ka- know Karim Benzema it's not Karim Benzema is it not no I'm sure he got given it's going to be someone really random isn't it but otherwise I wouldn't have asked the question that Rudiger T- it's not Rudiger Thibaut oh Courtois. it's Militao it's, it's Militao, Militao yeah. it's, it's Eda Militao I did read the athletic this morning so <laughs> just to let you know if you uh, your club's interested in buying Eda Militao it'll be a billion euros I'm sure they gave one of those billion euro release clauses to Isco as well and then realised that he was worth nowhere near that yeah. and flogged him but, but isn't the point of these that they have to do it by law in yeah, Spain. It's, obli- it's obligatory one, yeah. in Spain yeah. and they all want to avoid a Neymar happening to them. Yeah. Yeah. So they've like tripled all of their release clauses. I guess you wonder if that's a sort of rule that will, you know, a bit like how uh, Chelsea signed a bunch of players on nine year contracts and then the UEFA changed the rules immediately. I wonder whether La Liga will change the rules at some point because if all of your release clauses are a billion euros, then it kind of defeats the point of having them. Contract, yeah. yeah. People, I mean, people thought that about Neymar's. Feet, uh, release clause, though, didn't right. they? And then it got triggered. And like then somebody triggered it. Like yeah, 222. Yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, well, is it time for another break? Is that what time it is? 
Yeah, a quick break, and then we'll return to talk about more things that I don't know about yet. Ah, we have returned from a break. What a delightful break that was! Now, a, f- a quick wrap up of things that else that happened over the the weekend in England. There, uh, the the first of which, and the most amusing, I think we'll all agree, was Manchester United three one Fulham in the uh, quarter finals of the FA Cup. Now, uh, this game though mired with incidents, uh, wasn't it, JJ? Three of which, all did you see this one? Should yeah. I explain them? Yeah, all of which happened. Within the same forty seconds, what happened in this game? I was more uh, doing the eyebrow, the the mired because mm. you know it's one of those things we say we no one wants to see these scenes, but actually, actually everyone wants actually, to see. I like yeah. the scenes That's true. <laughs> Nobody, we shouldn't, we don't condone violence, but no. I do enjoy watching it. Yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't there, like it when you violence? go. Wasn't no, no, I'm not in that game. I'm just saying, yeah. gen, I'm just making a general I joke. I, 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 I only, fun. I enjoy it when all parties are consenting in the violence. Guys, uh, joking aside. <laughs> Uh, uh, the Mitrovic thing with the referee, uh, Goody gets sent off the and push. he should be banished to space jail for a, a Tell few Pete, weeks. in case they didn't, what he didn't see it. So at the end, well, at some point in the game, William uh, stopped a goal by punching the ball away with his hand. Yes. It's definitely a handball. He got sent off because it denies a goal scoring opportunity. I think that's the rule. Yeah. And uh, Mitrovic did not like this as the captain of Fulham. And he's been able to control himself a bit better this last season, I've noticed. He uh, doesn't lash out quite so much, but clearly they lost his head. Went up to the referee and then bars the referee aggressively to make him talk to him and yes. started pointing he right in his face. Sort of pushed his shoulder back in, in a direction that would force him to face him. Yeah. It's, a, it's the kind of thing that would definitely start a fight in a pub. If you did yeah. it, you just can't do it. And because yeah. the referees aren't going to hit you back, they seem defenceless. And because they're like, it's like this like anti-authoritarian thing that you, you want to. Yeah. People don't want authority, especially when things aren't going well in life. Yeah. And the referee symbolises authority. And at Sunday League, they, if that had happened, it'd be a brawl, yeah. full on brawl. I've seen awful things happen in Sunday League Uh, and it should be made an example of these Premier League football, Champions League footballers. If you start shouting and swearing at referees and going at them, uh, you should just be sent off. There is more and uh, more swearing at referees, isn't there? They just, like, they're not they, protected they, they at all. They sort of don't swear at them, but they kind of swear a lot loudly Around near them. them. <laughs> like, yeah. I saw... Um, I, I found it very hard not to snap back if it was me. I'm not going to name the player because I'm, I think every player does. This is just the example that comes into my mind. But it was from this game. It was a Manchester United player. And uh, it was a decision that uh, this player disagreed with. And right next to the linesman who'd just made the call, the player said, Oh, f- hell like that as if like for f- sake and you think I mean you haven't sworn at the linesman but you virtually have like there's a degree of difference there but there, not really there's something in it like in Sunday League even I'll moan at referee like yeah. nice old me if something goes that's obviously wrong like an offside but like what are you talking like that's clearly not an offside right. clearly not yeah but like alright whatever uh, some people I mean you get really aggressive people who take out all the life's problems they have on this guy who is a symbol yeah. of their uh, displeasure with life of Pappy <laughs> It's just everything's gone wrong, so Pappy, the referees... Pappy went for cigarettes. I mean, they have to get chased out. Like, people have to, In England, they've talked about it a lot with referees have had to be chased out of 11 aside at Sunday yeah. League games because they've been attacked like that. It's not saying sure. this is the thing, but... Referees that have to plan back, their route home. <laughs> people, people copy uh, what they see other footballers do, even grown adults. They yeah. copy what footballers do. They, they pretend to be injured and stuff like that. They just do stuff they see on TV because everyone is mostly performing a role and yeah. so they have to have role models and examples to follow because no one knows who they really are yeah. and so they just copy what they see from the people on the TV and then they see them do that sort of thing so it becomes fine do you know who you are? Uh, I th- no but then I question it often right whereas maybe some people don't what about you Ruben this is your first appearance on the TFO Football Podcast do you have a good sense of who you are as a person I think so yeah that sense is withering away the more the more mm. I talk to you yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no he's right that we need, we need to do something about the abuse that referees get I'm quite guilty of it at five aside level not like right. to the level that I'm going to spark a brawl and we're going to chase the referee out of Right. You know, the what you, little, a little slap. Do you know, just like <laughs> pass that comments with a smile to try and, you right. know, if something doesn't go my way. But this is like the third recent incident where a player has touched an official. Oh, Bruno and, pushed the... Yeah, and did Gabriel not do it against Man City as well? Something like that. Oh, I don't know. Um, but like Bruno got away with it. Yeah. Um, and so people will say, well, you know, where's the consistency if they sure. now punish Mitrovic for it? But somebody, they need to like draw a line because... It can't be accepted, that. Well, it's been drawn here, and it was quite funny. We should also point out that um, uh, while the referee had gone over to the VAR to check the William Handball, he also sent Marco <laughs> Silva, the Fulham manager, off, yeah. who clearly said something uh, rude. Didn't see what it was, yeah. but uh, that I, was amusing. I saw Alexander Mitrovic recently in Wandsworth Arcade. Did he push you? 
No, he was much more measured and calm. Really? In there and which surprised me because it was a chaotic environment. Well, but these lads are all fine <laughs> until, there's a, as, until there's one muscle to start it and one muscle to I end actually, it. I actually would have liked him to be a bit more rowdy at that point because uh, I was trying to play crazy golf and couldn't. Right, mm. right. I see. What was he doing in the arcade? I think he'd taken his kids for a, to a birthday party. Taking his kids. Yeah. So he wasn't on a game? No. But if he was, what game do you think he would have been on? Uh, the punching boxing <laughs> the punching thing boxing you, or yeah. whack-a-mole maybe yeah, yeah there was a it's like that Stuart Lee anecdote about uh, you want to give your fans what they expect of you so if someone meets Stuart Lee they yeah. want him to be kind of annoyed that he's there <laughs> did, that, uh, did that much have I told you this, he did that to me did he? good well, he got came to into Stuart a Lee's pub there. I was working in uh, to, his wife was performing uh, she's also a stand-up comedian his wife Bridget Christie Bridget Christie yeah. um, and he came to the bar and ordered two drinks and I was really excited and I got the drinks and I went back to him and I said, can I get these for you? I'm a big fan. And he laughed at me and said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then that was it. These days, if you offer to buy Stuart Lee a drink. <laughs> and what you want when you meet Mitrovic is for him to attack you and everything you stand for. That's, that is what I want, though, to be fair. Anyway, there we go. Uh, Man United scored almost immediately after the penalty that they also scored. So that game was kind of done. Good finish, And huh? uh, it was a good finish. Yes, it was by uh, Marcel Savica, wasn't it? Yeah. And then, of course, a Bruno Fernandes goal to put it to bed. I believe um, it, 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 uh, they got Brighton in the quarter fi- in the semifinals. Manchester City have Sheffield United yeah. in the semifinals. But, of course, City have already faced off Arsenal and Chelsea earlier in the campaign. So they've done the hard bit. And now you would expect... I got a romp to victory, aren't they? Uh, that's romp. Um, romp all the way to victory. You were romped before. I I romp on a daily basis. <laughs> I, to don't, be fair. I don't see you as a romping kind you of see man. See me as a romping man. No. You know when I come bowling in. I'm a, I'm a bowling man. I might be a bowler. Not Does a romping not have also sexual connotations? Yeah. Oh, to romp. No, that's not a proper tabloidy headline word, isn't it? Can be. Isn't be. It? But when one romps to victory, let's just look this up. Don't don't do Urban Dictionary. Obviously. I'm not going to do Urban Dictionary. Romp to victory. If you are, if you have become successful in the world of media by romping your way to victory, Joe, I'm <laughs> going to be very surprised. No, no, look. Uh, <laughs> no, I haven't, actually. But this means romp to, to win something such as a race or competition very easily. That's mm. all it means. Whereas I bowl around. I bowl around. That's what I do. Yeah? Let's just double check. I bowl. Bowl around definition. Uh, bowl down or along again the Cambridge di- the worst of the dictionaries it's no but, Mary uh, Webster is it they bowled down the street on their new bicycles I've never thought of being able to bowl on a bike you're going quickly apparently going I would try that sound like you. I thought it was more of a kind of ugh, like a swagger a smug sort of swagger bowling around having a good time no he'd be absolutely battering it down like a bowling ball towards the pins wouldn't you he'd be just so. smash what am I doing then if I'm sort of Sashaying, sashaying around, plodding. Yeah. I'm, pl- I'm not plodding. <laughs> Waddling. I do waddle sometimes, like a giant penguin. That's right. That's right. Anyway, um, we haven't got a lot of time, oh, yeah. so let's discuss Brentford Leicester because you guys went to this game. Brentford won, won Leicester City. Um, <laughs> was it fun? There was a red card here. You haven't said nothing for a while. No, it was great fun. Yeah, it's the. Uh, the second game I've been to live this season, which is a, a, a yeah. lot less than I usually do. But I also forgot the first game that I went to live this season, much to the uh, amusement of everyone. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, when this game, I tweeted this out, when this game finished, the guy in front of me turned around and said, which game was more for- forgettable, the one at Celtic Park or this one? What's well, so, that little humble brag there? Yeah. The guy in front knew who oh, he was. Oh, he's getting yeah. spotted. He's getting spotted. Oh, yeah, he's spotted. Oh. Yeah. 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 Gotta tell you about it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know, a guy spotted me uh, on Friday at the Old Red Lion Theatre pub, which is the best pub in London to watch football in. Right? <laughs> but uh, the guy, maybe maybe this was genuine. His name was Avi. Avi, uh, he, his friend, I think he was too embarrassed. So his friend said to me, oh, I, my friend thinks he recognises you and summoned me over to the table. I was like, great. This does happen sometimes. I th- I'm sure you will Did agree. Did you go over when you were summoned? I went over when I was summoned because but at that point, I'm just, I just, I'm a passive guy. I just do what I'm told. If someone summons me, I just go, just walk over, you know, try it. Yeah. I imagine I you quite enjoy that awkwardness as well. I, there's times where I do. I was with my family uh, on this evening, so I, I didn't enjoy it that much. But the, but the man, and again, uh, he was a lovely guy, Abby, and his friend very nice too. But this does, is a representative of something that does happen sometimes where somebody will say, oh, I think I know you, but I'm not really sure where from. 
And I get the impression that sometimes they do know why or where. They're just a bit embarrassed to kind of say it, you know. So then they make me say why they know me. Yeah, and, and also it's awful. It's one like, person I think I you, know yeah. you. Come over to the table and then tell everyone here, all of the other people who don't know who you are, by the way, tell everyone here why I know you. Uh, it's the worst. Thing. And do you know how unimpressed those other people are? Oh by, my god! I, I just yeah. don't want to. D- yeah. Someone asked me in the lift the other day if I was JJ Bull, and I said yes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I said yes. <laughs> yes. 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 It, it is nice when people say hi, though. Just to be clear, it is nice. Uh, you like it, don't you? That's nice when people say hi. I think that's it's true. Another way yeah. to make you make someone happy. I think that's a really good thing. Agree. I don't want to them think that at any point. I would be relevant to anyone else other than the person who sort of thinks they know me because they've seen me on YouTube loads. Right, yeah. Mm-hmm. What about your family? Close friends? What do you mean, my family? Are you relevant do to Do they recognise me? Do they get spotted by uh, your family? Probably not, no. <laughs> no. Yeah, fine. Neighbours? Okay, tell me more about this game. I mean, actually, just say whatever you want about it. I'm not sure what you wanted to say about it. It's just in here because you guys went to the game. Well, I really enjoyed watching the game. Mm. Uh, we were up behind the goal, right up high, uh, and the game was quite dull because right. Leicester made it really boring. Right. And In a good way? Uh, well, no, because boring is bad. For them, though. Well, not really. I mean, Leicester just let Brentford have the ball because that's the best way f- to get the ball back. Yeah. Rather than trying to win it, just let them give it to you. <laughs> Um, oh, Steve's written some questions here. I'm ever so sorry. I didn't see these before. Sorry, right. I forgot to do that earlier. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the differences between watching a game live from an, al- an, an-, an analysis point of view. <laughs> yeah. That's good, isn't it? And also, because you were in the kind of in the tactical cam position, weren't you? Because when you're behind high up the goal, you can sort of see the shapes more. I think you'd want to be side on mostly. You want to be side cam, on, yeah. do you? But I remember the tactical cam used to be a, a, a BBC portrait, one, didn't it? The BBC one's that yeah, not good? Uh, no I don't know. If it's really high, I guess you can see it. But like from where we were sat, it just looked like everything was really really close people people are like shoot when they're at the halfway line because yeah. where you're at yeah, you've, just, got, you've, you've got, got no power, depth like, perception yeah, exactly. I had that when I went to watch Palace lose 4-0 to Spurs I was sat directly behind the <laughs> you goal you really net, saw it row, row number two <laughs> and all I could see was the back of Hugo Lloris uh. <laughs> I think from an analysis point of view that I find interesting I mean John talked about this at the time was that you can uh, this sounds stupid, but you maybe know. What I mean, you can see the different characters of the players yeah. in real life. Yeah. You just cannot see it on a TV. No. So you can't work out what players are doing off, like out of possession half the time. When the what the TV shows you is obviously different, but then you don't see when there's a break in play that certain coaches come over and start talking to different sort of people. Yeah. You can see when something happens in one part of the pitch that it's clearly been a rehearsed set piece. You never think about it. Everything has been that's on there. It's like a chess game. Everything's yeah. got a way to go and where to go, and they're always being directed. In a far more uh, NFL way than maybe you appreciate sometimes. They've got a lot more in the head than you think. A lot more in the head, yeah. yeah. I always think as well that when you're there in the flesh, you get a much better sense of how good they are because yeah. it's much easier to put yourself in that frame of reference when it's happening on TV. You're kind of like, you know, the, this thing is happening over there. But when you're when you're actually behind the goal and you see these set pieces and you see how accurate the balls in yeah. are and the rotations on, on either side and where everyone knows where they should be. And it's just so much easier to be like, yeah, this, you know, this is the, the elite level of football, even though, you know, Brentford Leicester is, you wouldn't think of yeah. as being. The one that always gets me with that is watching goalkeepers catch crosses in the warm-up and how accurate the goalkeeper coaches yeah. crosses are it makes yeah. you think can, can he take the corners in <laughs> <laughs> he's probably spent a good t- portion of his life just doing yeah. that though doesn't he yeah, well true. we went with um, Ali Clarkson who is a TFL employee who supports Leicester and uh, he was telling us before who all the bad players were and why Leicester were so bad because obviously a fan would know more than because they've watched so much of the football yeah. And talking about asking whether Dewsbury Hall is actually good or Harvey Barnes actually good, what does he really think? And then you see the match in real life, and then Dewsbury Hall, for example, was just screaming his head off. I think it was at Tete on the right wing for Leicester. And I wouldn't notice this in the TV that like, Tete is brilliant. Like technically he's a brilliant player. Mm. And he was doing stuff that you really want to see him. But he seemed isolated from everyone else on the team. It was like there was a bunch there was a team of Leicester and that one guy on his own who just seemed to be always on his own and not as part of the team. Yeah. And it's kind of hard to explain without <clears throat> it's, it's, you can just sort of see more of it in real life and obviously like we go to games sometimes. this is the, the second game I've been to this season as well I've yeah. had to any games which is probably bad considering what I do for a job maybe but uh, I'm just so used to watching it on TV as the analysis side it is different and then it, that's why I did it by coaching badges remember is this the different. first game you've ever been to with John uh, yeah did it, in, did it enhance your experience yeah, because it was fun. We were just chatting all the way through it. It was great fun. Yeah. And we were, talk- we were spotting all things that we liked, all the tactic stuff, weren't we, John? That's was, why I did. I watched really on an armband. <laughs> he did. Yes, yeah, I saw a nice captain's armband. Yeah. Yeah. We had a really good really good day. Yeah? Mm. Good. 
It's nice, isn't it? Yeah, Steve Hankey with the big R. Then we went to the Heath. And then you went to the Heath. <laughs> there we go. Well, there we, I mean, well let's, let's dig into Brentford set pieces more on a different day because I know there's plenty to discuss there and now you've seen them in, in IRL. Uh, we can spend a little bit more time discussing them another time. One thing I forgot to mention about the uh, Man United-Fulham game, by the way, was uh, uh, Palinia, uh, score uh, was the uh, man of the match, uh, even despite the fact that it was uh, what, 2-1 at the time that he was recognised. But you mentioned it before, didn't you? A fantastic player for Fulham this season. Palinia. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely love that H- game. How often is a midfielder of the losing team in a game that's 3 1? A defensive midfielder. A defensive midfielder yeah. named the man of the match. I mean, that's pretty, it's an impressive performance. Oh, and... if, you're, if you're so good at it that you get recognised, that's kind of rare because often their yard is really good and don't yeah. get picked up. But it might be one of those things that it makes the, the pundit or whoever's choosing the man of the match look clever because they've spotted this thing that now everyone knows about. I actually think it's, it was, I think it was. Was it Steve McManaman who was doing the comms on that game? I can't remember. It was Lee Dixon. I Lee think. Dixon it was, you're right. Um, I think Lee Dixon's problem was that he couldn't pick a United player because until they scored the penalty and were given the penalty, yeah. they would f*** <laughs> in that game. <laughs> yeah, they they were. Were, and you, I mean, it would have been embarrassing to pick one. So he did a good job and picked the best Fulham player. There we go. Uh, fine, I think that's the end of the podcast. Is that right, Steve Hankey? Yeah, big uh, nodding of the head there. Uh, rating out of 10 for Ruben Pinder's performance, JJ Ball? I'd say 11. 11 that's out of 10. A, a beyond the solid. That might sound too patronising, actually. I'm going to say 10. <laughs> yeah, just say 10. <laughs> yeah. I'll that's say nice. nine and a half to sound even slightly less. You're going to say nine and a half. There's always room yeah. for improvement. Yeah, fine. Yeah, always fine. room for improvement. Well, yeah, I, I should have done that. It's a room for improvement. You always... That's true. Mine's yeah. a three. Yours is a three? Yeah. You think you've done a three? <laughs> yeah. Why, Why do you think that? I've talked too much. You didn't get enough out of John. I don't think that's true. I think John talked a lot at the beginning yeah. and then took a breather. You didn't. And then t- you yeah, picked you up the mantle. enough at the beginning. Maybe it's like the uh, lens of the classical. It's all uh, basketball. I don't know about See, you. I'm warm now. Like, I'm flows. sick of it. I think we shouldn't blame the players. We should blame the manager. Yeah, I agree. This is the problem then. You played Let's too much Rocket Steve. League with John. <laughs> <laughs> so you're bored. I want to hear more from John. But you talked to him all the time on Rocket League. I've already heard what he wants to say. Yeah. yeah. You see? So this is the thing. Yeah, I shall no true. longer talk to Joe on Rocket League. Yeah. Maybe we should all start playing Rocket Play League. Play Warzone with not me. Do a podcast anymore. Maybe we should yeah. record the podcast playing Rocket League. We suggested this and we started doing deep. Oh, that's <laughs> like a good idea. It's a good idea. We started, yeah. I, the, thing, the problem is that um, I take on a completely different personality when I play that game <laughs> and it's not fun. It's for not an very audience. nice. There's a genuine suggestion when we do like a TIFO staff meeting. While playing Call of Duty, one day. <laughs> it was just an idea. It might be a you good played Civ Six a lot, didn't you? Didn't that wasn't that thing. Joe doesn't play that. No, that wasn't me. He played that, and Alex Stewart used to play he's Civ Six as well. Henry yeah, he's used good to play, that. and Henry Henry Craig used people. to play as well. You Mac- what do you play? You play any video games? I just play the F1 game. You play the F1 game. Yeah. Do you have a steering wheel? I don't. I'm not that much of a loser, but um, <laughs> oh, I, I think that's, I think that's that. cool. No, it looks like it looks more fun, but I'm just very conscious of how. Yeah. Oh, how other people can see you, even though they can't see you do it. Well, wow. Yeah. However, by the way, do you know we went to, remember when we went to the Red Bull uh, uh, yeah, racing? Yeah. E- oh, e- this is a humble thing. brag, is it? No, no. Yeah, we made a video about this, but um, the guy, the, the young uh, e-driver. Sebastian Joe. Taught, uh, Sebastian yeah. Joe. I saw him tweet uh, yesterday or the day, the day before. He'd obviously been in a, in, this is a professional e-sports uh, racer. He'd obviously been in a, in a race and he'd clipped a little bit of it and his comment was like some something like, oh, great to it's like the amount of points lost because of the net code. The amount of points lost because of net code. And then you see in the clip, he's, he's driving alongside another car. There's nowhere near each other. And he's just he has a little impact off nothing, off the air, and then gets... And that's his job. Off. That would be infuriating. Can you imagine all the times you play, you've played a war zone or something? Yeah. Can you imagine all the times that, you know, if, you, if you're actually doing that for money and you get killed because of some... Random well, as my thing. close friends will attest, unlike <laughs> the things I've learned recently in uh, <laughs> how to win friends and influence people, I blame everyone but myself often <laughs> if I'm in a bad mood. If I'm in a good mood, I can be positive and just drive a buggy around and run people over. Yeah, yeah. I would like to clarify no disrespect to people who do own the steering wheels. Sure. Yeah. I want yeah. to embolden you with the confidence to be able to do that yeah, and not yeah, worry about well, it. It's great. Get a steering my, wheel. So when, I, dream. when I play that game, my dad watches me play and yeah. he acts as like my mechanic on the radio. Nice. So he's like, don't do anything stupid. You've got a five second lead on the staff. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. And then my brother comes in and tells me to turn right when I need to turn left and yeah. turn left when I need to Perfect. turn right to try and put me off. I like it. Um, you should get a steering wheel. We should. Yeah. Yeah. You should get the whole rig. Get the whole rig. Yeah, mm, proper yeah. seat and everything where you're sitting about like this. I mean, why Might not? Well. I, have to, I have to just go yeah. nuts. If I was into that, I would go. I would yeah. Go. yeah, I would too. If I was into that. My, yeah. my brother in law has one. I've tried one. There it's, we go. It's good fun. Thank What's your dad's name? Jack. Jack? Sort it out, Jack. Come on. Get Reuben the gift of his dreams, maybe for Christmas. 
The steering wheel for the pretend car. Yeah, I get it. No. <laughs> anyway, just a quick thing before we finish. I, I know, I know, we've got to finish, Steve. Thank you. I know we've got to finish, but I just want to tell you what uh, Arsenal's last ten fixtures of the season are. This is quite. This is quite an exciting bit for the end, isn't it? It's an exciting bit for the end. Now, what have we got here? Arsenal's final ten fixtures in the Premier League: uh, home to Leeds, away to Liverpool, away to West Ham, home to Southampton, away to Man City, home to Chelsea, away to Newcastle, home to Brighton. And then away to Nottingham Forest and home to Wolves. That is not easy. That is a pretty normal run, isn't it? There's I would yeah. say... I don't know why that's why, interesting. Oh, no. <laughs> like why? Oh, oh, oh. They're oh, going to win most oh, of those games. Oh. Well, listen, listen, listen. Yeah, uh, away to, to Man City, all. home to Chelsea, away to Newcastle, home to Brighton. It's a tough run. Those, those are and the tough ones. And also, the two before come against teams that are basically on the verge of relegation who will be doing absolutely everything to try and win Joel, those games. every game in the Premier League is a difficult game. Every game is a difficult there game. There are no easy games. There are no easy, there games. Are no easy games. Well, there we go. I thought that was going to be a bigger... Guys! The last 10 games, a Premier League side, a Premier League side a Premier League side a Premier League Jeez. side Jeez, every single one's a Premier League side yeah. that's only yeah. four you've only said four uh, Premier League side 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 Wolves oh. and there we go Yay. that's the end of the TIFO Football Podcast uh, thank you to Ruben Pinder thank you uh, JJ Ball the Bullard yes and uh, John Heathcliff McKenzie <laughs> thank you uh, au revoir we'll see you uh, next uh, well I won't be here next week or the week after <laughs> busy but uh, michael bailey will be here for one of those weeks and then for the other week we'll just fuck it out i guess <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but until then ta-ra bienvenue and all the best goodbye <laughs>